Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue our discussion of rendering uh, by talking about more details of the ray casting algorithm. Uh, in particular we're going to talk about how to intersect rays with triangles which is really critical for rendering meshes. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some other tricks like how to render a model when it's been transformed using a matrix or how to compose a scene together that has multiple copies of the same model and so on. So let's get started. Let's begin with a big, uh, or rather a quick recap of our previous lecture. Um, essentially in our last lecture, we gave a quick introduction to rendering really broadly. So rendering is a term that refers to producing a picture or an image based on a scene description. And there are many different variants of rendering algorithms, but the two main universes that are worth being aware of are ray casting or ray tracing. Uh, remember the distinction being whether or not you generate secondary rays. And rasterization, which is more like drawing or painting uh, rather than simulating light as it bounces around a scene. We talked about some of the basics of ray casting last time, and that included how to set up your camera. Um, which essentially amounted to how to produce rays that are going to go out into your 3D scene. We talked about how to represent a ray, uh, and this is going to be critical today too, right? A ray, oops. Ray is just an uh, origin point plus t times a direction point, where if t is greater than zero, uh, then you're in front of the ray, which is what you typically want. And then we talked about how to compute the intersection point between a ray and a plane, as well as between a ray and a sphere. And those are going to be our starting point for today's computations. So our first goal today is to extend some of the math that we did last time to intersecting between a ray and a triangle. Uh, so there are, of course, many different ways to do this, as with any problem in ray tracing, but we're going to introduce a particularly smart approach which is going to inform many of our graphics algorithms moving forward by using a technique uh, known as barycentric coordinates. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that we're already 85% of the way there toward ray triangle intersection using the previous algorithm. In particular, if I think of my triangle uh, and I take the triangle face and I just extend the edges out to infinity, what do I get? Well, I get a plane, right? So in some sense, I could do ray triangle intersection by intersecting a ray with a plane and then figuring out does that intersection point lie inside or outside of the triangle? And that's a totally reasonable approach. In fact, in some sense, what we're going to talk about today is pretty closely linked to that strategy. We're just going to do it in sort of a nicer form, both notationally and mathematically. So let's see what that looks like. So let's talk about how we could define a plane. So in our previous lecture, we defined a plane as a source point, right? So some point P plus two edge vectors. E1 and E2. And then the plane is essentially the locus of all points uh, that looks like P plus some vector along E1 plus some other vector along E2. This is a perfectly reasonable way to define a plane. I think it's what we're all used to from linear algebra class, but it's not the only one. So a different way to think about it would be to draw a triangle on our plane, for instance, consisting of points A, B, and C, like what we see on our slide here. And then we can write any point P on our plane using the expression that I've given you on the slide here, namely that if I take alpha, beta, and gamma, satisfying a very important constraint, which is that they sum to one, then I can produce a new point on the plane by taking a weighted average of A, B, and C. Namely, you know, alpha times A, beta times B, and gamma times C. Now, as a sanity check, you should be asking, but Justin, there, there are three parameters here, and a plane is two-dimensional. 
Um, that's absolutely right. And the reason the plane ends up being two dimensional is that I'm forcing alpha, beta, and gamma to sum up to one. And again, really the right way to interpret this formula is that it's a weighted average. So for instance, I don't know if alpha, beta, and gamma were one third, then I'd end up at the very center of the triangle, which is, you know, just the average of a, b, and c. Um, but I haven't constrained alpha, beta, and gamma to be positive. So in fact, I could end up with a weighted average that's outside of those three points by taking one of them to be negative, but they still have to add up to one. If they don't add up to one, then I end up outside of the plane. So this idea is known as barycentric coordinates. Uh, and, and, and the particular uh, idea of the barycentric coordinates is if I take any point on the plane uh, and I write it as this weighted average, P of alpha, beta, gamma, then those three numbers, alpha, beta, and gamma, form the barycentric coordinates of that point with respect to uh, the three vertices of the triangle, A, B, and C. So this is just like a parametrization of the plane, but notice that it depends on the three vertices of the triangle, right? I could have some different triangle in the same plane, uh, and the barycentric expression would be different. On the slide, I've provided you with a simplified expression. So in case it's bugging you uh, that there are three uh, coordinates, but a plane is two dimensional, one thing that I can do is I can write alpha as one minus beta minus gamma. And now I can plug that in to our first term here. So when I do that, of course, this is what happens. So now I get a function of just P of beta and gamma, and then I'm going to fill in that implicit uh, expression for alpha. And we can regroup terms a little bit, and what we end up with is a familiar formula here. So take a look. So now we get alpha is kind of like a base point, and we have beta and gamma scaling two different vectors in the plane. So in other words, this recovers the formula that we drew on the previous slide. So this uh, and our picture here is like a base point plus two different vectors that can slide along the plane. Now, one question you might ask is, do beta and gamma have to satisfy any constraints? Remember that originally we had alpha plus beta plus gamma equals one. And the answer to that question is no, right? Because what we can do is, in fact, what we have done <laughs> is chosen alpha to be one minus beta minus gamma. So if we sum alpha, beta, and gamma together, we're going to get one just by definition. Okay, so if we wrote, uh, you know, alpha, if we identified with P on our previous slide, B minus A as E1, and C minus A as E2, then we get our sort of traditional parametrization of the plane. Okay, so that's the idea of barycentric coordinates. So just to recap a little bit, if I have a point in a plane, and I have a triangle in that plane, then I can write that point as a weighted average of the vertices of the triangle, and the weights of the weighted average are the barycentric coordinates of that point. So you might ask, uh, is this an implicit or an explicit uh, barycentric definition of the plane? I wouldn't get too hung up on this terminology, but it's worth knowing. And the answer is that it's explicit, right? There's a function that goes from alpha, beta, gamma to that point. So this is a parametrization. This is different from like, uh, at, at one point, remember we also talked about a plane as the locus of points that look like, you know, the normal vector dot your point plus a constant equals zero. So this is an explicit parametrization of the plane and that's convenient to work with in the ray tracing universe. Fun fact, uh, we can call P a weighted barycenter. Um, so the term barycenter, again, as with most things, predates uh, rendering technology. Um, and one of many ways that you can talk about barycenters is if I put weights proportional to alpha, beta, and gamma at A, B, and C, kind of hung them off, and then balanced our triangle at point P, um, point P would be the location where the triangle doesn't fall. Um, and that's what defines a, a barycenter. Uh, 
Incidentally, I don't love this terminology. I think the term barycenter by itself typically refers to just the point where alpha equals beta equals gamma equals one third. So just fun fact, nothing terribly important to know. So although I keep drawing a triangle for you guys, the reality is that this function on the top of the slide here, um, this function really is giving us a parameterization of the entire plane uh, that includes A, B, and C. But our goal today is to talk about how to deal with triangles. And of course, triangles have insides, <laughs> and we need to account for that. And here's how we can do it. So this function P of alpha, beta, gamma, with the constraint that they sum to 1, parametrizes the entire plane. If we add a constraint that alpha, beta, and gamma are greater than or equal to 0, then we just get the interior of the triangle, or I guess technically the interior of the triangle plus its boundary. Um, you can convince yourself of this pretty easily. So uh, essentially alpha, beta, and gamma, just as I've alluded to already, form the weights of a weighted average, right? And of course, if I take a weighted average of A, B, and C with positive weights, then I'll end up in the interior of the triangle and if I have negative weights, then I start pushing outside. Uh, if you guys want to prove this at home, I encourage you to give that a try. Uh, one way that you can do it is to use this little reduction um, two slides ago where we eliminate alpha altogether. Uh, and I think this makes it a pretty straightforward uh, setup to check that particular relationship. Notice that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals one, and now we have that they're also non-negative. So non-negative numbers that sum up to one in particular have the property that they're between zero and one. One thing that is worth noting, however, is that checking if alpha, beta, and gamma is between zero and one, well, it might feel mathematically like that's actually not sufficient, right? Um, remember that we need them uh, Oops, what am I saying? Actually, of course, it, it is sufficient. <laughs> uh, that is to say that um, if we check that alpha, beta, and gamma are between 0 and 1, uh, then indeed our point is inside of the triangle. Um, we don't need to do anything tricky. There's a few sanity checks. Um, notice that, for example, uh, when alpha equals 0, what ends up happening? Well, then it's beta b plus gamma c. And remember that beta and gamma still have to add up to 1 in that case. So what am I going to get? It's a weighted average between B and C that's going between 0 and 1. So it's parametrizing this edge here. And of course, if alpha and beta equals 0, then P equals C. So I just get this corner point. Um, so all that's to say that, uh, you know, some special cases include the outer edge and the vertices of the triangle, and those are pretty easy to recover by taking one or two of the coordinates to be zero, respectively. Okay, so here's our, our review of what we have so far. We have this barycentric coordinate expression, which writes P as a weighted average of A, B, and C. If I want to be barycentric coordinates, the one condition that I have to satisfy uh, is that the weights sum up to one. And if additionally they're not negative, then I know I'm inside of the triangle. So all of this is to say that if I do my ray tracing algorithm, I shoot out a ray and I compute the point where the ray intersects the triangle, or rather the plane spanned by the triangle, and I compute the barycentric coordinates of that point, then I can just check if they're bigger than or equal to zero. And what I know is that the ray actually intersects the triangle and not just the plane um, that the triangle lies in. So. That's great. We now have our toehold into figuring out how to intersect a ray with a triangle, right? We can compute the barycentric coordinates and check their sign. But what haven't I told you yet? Well, I haven't told you how to actually compute the barycentric coordinates. So that's what we'll do next. It turns out there are a lot of clever ways to compute barycentric coordinates. I'm going to start with a fun formula that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just because I'm a geometry professor and I want to share it. Uh, and then we'll do the one that people actually do. Um, I'm not sure historically which one came first, actually, because this, this one kind of looks like old school geometry. Um, but let's say that I have a point P 
This is easier to draw when you're inside a triangle. And now I'm going to divide the triangle by taking P and just connecting it to the three vertices. Then one thing that you can check, this is kind of miraculous that that happens, is that if I want the barycenter coordinates of one point, the way that I can get that is by taking the triangle opposite that point. When I say opposite, I mean the, the, there are three sub-triangles that I've drawn here. The sub-triangle that does not touch that vertex. Um, and I can say, okay, I'm going to compute the area of this sub-triangle and I'm going to divide it by the area of the entire triangle. And that is going to get you the barycentric weight corresponding to this vertex. Similarly, you know, for this, uh, the top vertex, I would use that triangle and so on. So I can compute those three ratios and um, each of those is actually equal to the barycentric coordinates of this point we have in the inside. Now, it turns out that this formula actually works even when you're not inside of the triangle, but then it gets a little bit tricky to draw. So now you have a triangle. You have a point P, like somewhere on the outside. Then what you have to do is you still connect everything together like that. But now you have to use signed areas, like they need to be negative uh, for flip triangles that are flipped over. Of course, there's a chicken and an egg problem here, right? Our whole point is to define methods for computing barycentric coordinates that will allow us to figure out whether a point is on the inside or the outside of a triangle. And so needing to know that fact as a uh, prerequisite to computing barycentric coordinates is not particularly useful. But this is just a fun formula. Uh, it's really fun exercise to prove at home uh, that this formula should work. Notice that it's actually quite easy to show that at the very least they sum up to one, right? Because uh, in this setup, alpha plus beta plus gamma is equal to the area of the three sub-triangles, AA plus AB plus AC, divided by the area of the entire triangle. But the entire triangle is built up out of those three triangles. So, of course, that ratio is one. Okay, so anyway, this is just a fun way to get a little bit of intuition. Um, notice, for example, if I take this point and I move it toward the corner, this uh, opposite triangle dominates and the ratio reaches one, which is sort of what you would expect for barycentric coordinates. Now, in practice, uh, these formulas are not super useful, or they can be, but not in our particular context. So instead, we're going to use a different approach. And that's algebraic. We're going to write a linear system of equations. You guys can probably tell I'm recording this lecture early in the morning. I need my coffee and keep making mistakes. Okay, so let's, uh, let's write a little bit of algebra here. So remember that I can take a point, P, and I can write it as a, our corner point, plus beta times E1 plus gamma times E2, where E1 and E2 are the two edges uh, of our triangle. Right, so use E1 and E2. Okay, so uh, in particular, E1 is equal to B minus A and E2 is equal to C minus A. So if we think about it, I'll be careful about you know points versus uh, vectors here. What's going on? So each of these objects is in 3D. So really, even though I've written one formula here, this is actually three formulas. Do you see that? Um, in particular, we have P1, P2, and P3 is equal to A1, A2, A3 plus gamma, or beta rather, E11, E12, E13 plus gamma, E21, E22, E23. Okay, so if I take each of the rows of this expression, then I get a different 
linear relationship that can help us determine our unknowns. Remember that the unknowns, because we're trying to compute barycentric uh, coordinates, are beta and gamma. So really, even though it looks like one equation, it's actually three. <laughs> um, now that feels great. It's like three for one discount here, uh, but it's actually too good, right? We have three equations, but we only have two unknowns. Do you see that? Because I've already eliminated alpha and I'm just writing this expression in terms of beta and gamma. So in other words, uh, here's our, by the magic of PowerPoint, here's some better handwriting. So here's our expression um, that P is equal to the A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2, where each of these things is a three-dimensional vector. So I have a non-square system of equations, um, which somehow feels uh, <laughs> uncomfortable. But really what's going on is that even though this formula looks three-dimensional, all the action is going on in the ABC plane. Uh, so motions uh, normal to the triangle are sort of uninteresting. There are many different ways to recover that structure, but there's one really easy mathematical trick that can. In particular, let's take our expression here. I'll maybe put a star next to it for good luck. And now let's do the inner product or the dot product of that expression with E1, right? So now I get E1 dot product with A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2. In fact, let's move the P uh, to the other side while we're at it. Minus P equals zero and E2 dot A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2 minus P equals zero. Incidentally, uh, let's all be grown-ups here. I'm going to stop writing the vector sign over all of our vectors. Uh, advanced mathematicians oftentimes leave that out uh, just because it's kind of a pain to keep writing it. Okay, so all I did is I took our expression star I took the dot product of that expression with E1 and E2, uh, respectively. So here's what that looks like in uh, better uh, notation here. And now notice that this object has two equations, right? These are scalars and two unknowns, so life is good. <laughs> in fact, uh, we can factor this expression just for fun. So if I distribute out the dot product, what am I going to get? I'll have beta e1 dot e1 plus gamma e1 dot e2, which I can write as follows. I write e1 dot e1, e1 dot e2. In fact, let's just go ahead and define a convenient matrix. Notice our matrix is actually symmetric because dot products commute. So if we read our first row and we distribute out, we'll have E1 dot E1 and E1 dot E2 times beta gamma. And what am I going to have on the right hand side? I'll have E1 dot P and E1 minus E1 dot A. And similarly, if I get the expression, the second expression here, E2 dot P minus A. And this is a two by two system of equations. This we can actually solve. There it is in you know nicer uh, LaTeX format. So what have I done here? Well, we started by looking at our original expression and just noticing that there's too much information, but I can extract a nice two by two symmetric system of equations for beta and gamma um, by taking the dot products of both sides of that expression with E1 and E2 and then just taking those expressions and writing them in nice matrix form uh, by factoring. By the way, just for completeness, um, beta and gamma are two of the very center coordinates, but we're missing the third one, uh, which is alpha. But of course, we know just by definition that alpha is one minus beta minus gamma, uh, so we can recover it after the fact. Okay, so what did we just do? Essentially, we're given a point in a plane, then 
we can compute its barycentric coordinates using a linear algebra approach, uh, like what I've outlined here. Um, notice that this computation assumes that P is in the plane. <laughs> if P is out of the plane, uh, this computation actually won't detect it. So this is just sort of a warm-up problem uh, on our way to getting a triangle ray intersection. Just a nice linear algebra exercise, largely to get your instructor uh, to finish his coffee for the morning. Okay, but what we're really after today is not just to find the barycentric coordinates of a point in a plane, but rather to intersect a ray with a triangle. And this is close, but it's not quite the same. So again, we can think of P of T as our ray. And what does uh, our ray look like? Well, it looks like the ray origin plus t times the ray direction. Remember that t takes this vector out of your eye and scales it different amounts. And then meanwhile, well, I also want that there's some point p of t that also has barycentric coordinates inside of my triangle. So I'd also like that this is equal to p of uh, maybe just beta and gamma, where this is a plus beta e1 plus gamma e2. Okay, so what, uh, what are we to do? Um, well, we can think of this kind of like shooting practice with a target. So on the one hand, I have this triangle with three vertices and it's sitting on one side. And there are these three knobs that are attached to those three vertices that are barycentric coordinates of a point. All right, so maybe I can draw it on the slide. I have a triangle and there's like three little controller knobs uh, that are sitting at those triangles, uh, those vertices that are controlling the position of a point inside of the triangle. And now I shoot a ray toward the triangle. The ray has just one uh, controller, that's T, which is the distance that I slide along the ray. So again, I have alpha, beta, and gamma, or maybe just beta and gamma, because I've eliminated alpha on the triangle. I have T on the ray, which is telling me how far to move. And in some sense, what's going on is, if I think of like a little animation, there's a point that's flying toward the triangle here, and now I've got alpha, beta, and gamma who are trying to catch that point so that it lands right on the triangle. And so there's sort of two controllers that I have to control. There's beta and gamma on the triangle, there's T on the ray, and I want those things to be equal so that when that ray punctures the plane, um, I detect it using beta and gamma. Okay, so here's a nicer formatted version of these equations. So essentially, what do I end up with? is another system of equations. So on the one hand, I could write my point by moving along the ray until it runs into the triangle. On the other hand, I can write my point as a weighted average of the three vertices, and I wanna set those two things equal to one another. In other words, when I intersect my ray with the triangle, I should satisfy the expression on the slide here, that R naught plus T times RD, right? That's the position along the ray, should equal a plus beta b minus a plus gamma c minus a. This is the barycentric expression on the triangle. So if I can solve this equation for t, beta, and gamma, I can of course again check that uh, alpha is equal to 1 minus beta minus gamma. Then what do I get? I get all of the information I could possibly want, right? In particular, I get the uh, T along uh, at which the ray intersects the triangle, and I get the barycentric coordinates of the position of the intersection all in one shot. Now, remember that that intersection does not necessarily have to be inside of the triangle, right? Like I have a triangle here, and then the ray just zips right past it. What's gonna happen in that case well, in that case, your barycentric coordinates are not all going to be positive. So at the end of the day, if you want to check whether your ray actually intersects your triangle or not, you can solve this equation here. 
And then you can check three conditions. You want beta and gamma to be positive. You'd also like alpha to be positive. Or if you don't feel like computing alpha, then notice that alpha is one minus beta minus gamma. So you want that to be positive. Different way of putting it is that of course, beta plus gamma is less than or equal to one. And that's this third condition here. Okay, so that is how we can intersect a ray with the plane of a triangle. And then just by checking three easy conditions, uh, make sure that that ray actually goes through the inside of the triangle and not the outside. Okay, so let's do this in a little bit more detail. And our main point is going to be, how can we solve this expression that I've put a star next to? Now notice the, unlike our previous case, how many unknowns are there? Well, there's unknowns. Um, uh, the three unknown values are T, beta, and gamma. So there's three, and there's three equations. There are three equations because really this starred formula here uh, has three different parts for the X, Y, and Z coordinates. In fact, let's write that out. now. I'm too lazy to actually do this in PowerPoint, so I went ahead and wrote it out ahead of time. So I took our previous formula, like what we showed here, and I've just expanded out the x, y, and z coordinates. Notice that it's not like there's t, x, or beta, x, or gamma, x. The, the t, beta, and gamma are the same in all three of these. It's just the coefficients in front of them that are changing. Okay, so now, what do we do? Well, as with just about anything in algebra, we're going to isolate our unknowns uh, and then solve uh, for them. So that's what I've started to do here. So in particular, for example, let's take a look. The coefficient of beta in the first expression is bx minus ax. And that's what I see here. The coefficient of gamma is cx minus ax. Oops, oh no, there's a sign mistake. Is that right? Let's see here, beta, bx. Ah, yeah, okay, so I'm also gonna move the, uh, the variables to the other side. And you can see that because the coefficient in front of t is uh, r uh, dx, this is the x coordinate of the um, direction of the ray. So notice that instead of, if I want to put uh, the t, the beta, and the gamma all on the same side of the equation, then the sign of, of one of these guys has to change. So I'm going to move it to the left-hand side, meaning that we have a B minus A here, and then an A minus B, <laughs> and our expression there. Whew. Uh, similarly, uh, we have C minus A in front of gamma. That becomes A minus C in front of gamma, and so on. And then at the end of the day, we're going to move the R to the right-hand side, and that's what's going to give us A minus R. So I've probably totally botched this and confused everybody in the class, but the high level point is that I just took these three expressions here and I wrote them in nice linear algebra notation. That's it. That's, that's the only thing that happened here. Okay. So now we have a three by three system of linear equations. If we want to intersect a ray with a triangle, all we have to do is invert, right? So if we call this, you know, matrix M, and this is our unknowns, maybe this is x and this is b, then, well, we just want to write x is equal to m inverse times b. That's it, just like we're used to in linear algebra class. Now, three by three linear systems of equations are kind of nice because they're relatively small, uh, so we can actually solve them in closed form. We don't necessarily need algorithms like Gaussian elimination. We can use them. Uh, for numerical purposes, it may actually be better. But if you just want a quick way to uh, hack together your solution here, um, there are formulas for the solution of a three by three uh, linear system. One of the famous ones that you might have learned in linear algebra class, something called Kramer's rule, where essentially you can recover beta, gamma, and T um, using ratios of different determinants uh, from your matrix. Or if you're a computer scientist and you don't care about the math here, you can also just type these formulas mechanically into your code and voila, you will get beta, gamma, and T, which is what you need. As always, if you want that third barycentric coordinate alpha, it's just one 
minus beta minus gamma. And that's just a byproduct of the way that we set up this formula. So let's summarize a tiny bit. So we have a array which has parameters that look like RO and RD, like the origin and the direction. We have a triangle uh, which has vertices, uh, I don't know, A, B, and C. So if we want to intersect a ray with a triangle, we need to solve for three numbers, really four numbers, but that fourth one, alpha, is kind of easy to obtain later. And those numbers are the very central coordinates of the intersection point and the t along the ray at which the intersection happens. And so we solve for all of those in one shot using essentially the formulas that we've derived and are written on this slide here. Um, so this is pretty cool. It, it gives you all the information you could possibly want for intersecting a ray with a triangle. And now if you want to check if the ray actually intersects the triangle rather than the plane that the triangle sits in, all you have to do is check to make sure that alpha, beta, and gamma are all bigger than or equal to zero. So there is a lot of advantages to using this barycentric intersection formula. For one, it's fairly efficient. I mean, there's obviously a fair amount of math here, uh, but at least it's just a nice formula. Um, you don't have to deal with that plane equation and then checking to make sure that triangles haven't flipped upside down or something. Um, but there's an added benefit which computer graphics people use a lot. And that is that you get barycentric coordinates for free. That is to say that it doesn't just tell you the location, like X, Y, Z, of where a ray intersects a triangle. It also sort of explains it in terms of barycentric coordinates. And we're going to see that that's useful uh, for interpolation. So for instance, let's say that I want to render a triangle. And not only do I want to render it, meaning that I need to figure out which rays actually intersect the triangles and which one don't. But I also want to color it in a nice smooth way. So I'm going to label, for example, this vertex is green. Eh. Uh, this vertex is blue and this vertex is red. And I want a nice smooth color gradient along the triangle. Well, there's a nice trick for being able to do that, which is to use the barycentric coordinates as weighted averages. So remember, for example, the barycentric coordinates of uh, this point here might be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, right? Because the barycentric coordinates of the vertices of a triangle uh, just have a single one and then all the rest are zeros. And then as I move into the triangle, the barycentric coordinates, they stay summing up to one. They still represent a weighted average, um, but they slide around smoothly. So here's a common trick in computer graphics. This is called barycentric interpolation. This is really critical for you guys to understand, which is to say, let's say I have a triangle that's defined by three points, A, B, and C. So these are the vertices of our triangle. But now I'm going to attach some additional information to the vertices. So some values, V1, V2, and V3. So the very typical example would be color. So for example, maybe I write them as, as RGB values. And now my goal here is to interpolate those values to the interior of the triangle. So I want to know like what is the color of the triangle at point P given the colors of the vertices and some assumption that the color moves smoothly along the face of the triangle. This is a model, by the way. I mean, God didn't tell us this is the right way to interpolate color along a triangle. It's just a reasonable way to do it. Well, what am I going to do? I can do this in two steps. The first is to take P and write it in barycentric coordinates. So to compute those three values, alpha, beta, and gamma, I can do that by, for example, solving the linear systems that we've already talked about uh, in previous parts of today's lecture. But our goal here is not just to locate the point P, it's actually to interpolate the colors. So now what I do is I reuse alpha, beta, and gamma to take that weighted average. So I compute the position of the point P in terms of the vertices. And then I reuse those weights as uh, averaging weights for the color. 
So for example, as a sanity check, notice that the color of V1 will stay green because it's uh, barycentric coordinates it'll just look like one of the identity vectors. I think I might have swapped the different slots here, but that doesn't matter a whole lot. So this is just a nice trick. Um, so this is a way that I can, for example, make color change smoothly along a triangle mesh, but only have information that's specified at the vertices of that mesh. Okay. So that's going to conclude our discussion of barycentric coordinates. Um, this is a great topic for you guys to thoroughly understand mathematically. It's one that I'll be sure to cover on the exam because it's really critical to get right. Um, so if you have any questions about this, be sure to discuss them on Piazza and to get started on your homework early because it can be a little bit tricky if you're still uh, remembering your linear algebra. Okay, so the remainder of today's lecture covers a grab bag of other interesting topics in um, the ray casting world uh, as we deepen and uh, further our discussion of rendering. Um, so we're going to go through a few other topics that are worth knowing uh, sort of one after the next here. So one really quick one is just to notice that Ray casting and then more generally ray tracing are fabulous examples where object-oriented programming makes a whole lot of sense. So hopefully you guys remember that object-oriented programming, the basic uh, idea of this paradigm is that the main things that we're going to manipulate when we write code are these things called objects, right? An object um, essentially is grouping together all kinds of information about a particular uh, piece of our computational setup. Now, the nice thing about object-oriented design and ray tracing is that the objects are actually objects. <laughs> you know, they're actually physically things uh, in our scene. Um, in addition to things like rays, your camera, and so on, bits about everything can be an object. So some of the really key ideas of object-oriented uh, programming are inheritance and polymorphism. The basic idea here is that, let's say that I send a ray out into the world during my ray casting algorithm. So I have my scene is composed of a bunch of objects and I wanna know what object my ray hits first. Now, here's kind of an interesting observation. From the perspective of the ray tracing algorithm, does it matter whether the ray hits a sphere or a cube or a plane or a triangle or whatever? No, the only thing that matters is that for each object in my scene, I need to be able to find the intersection between my ray and that object. That's it. It does not matter what kind of object that is. There's no special case here. And so that allows us to have a really nice abstraction. So in particular, we could make a class like something called object 3D. And the only thing I'm going to tell the universe is that Anything that is an object in my scene has to implement one function called intersect. An intersect takes an array, maybe some other information, and outputs whether or not that ray intersects that object. And that's it. That's all I need for ray casting. Now, the ray casting algorithm is this loop here, and it can just iterate over all the objects in the scene and intersect the ray with each one of them, even though the ray casting algorithm doesn't know that the sphere is different from the plane, is different from a cube. So in particular, I can make one abstract class called object 3D, and then a bunch of different classes like plane, sphere, triangle mesh, maybe a group which itself contains other objects. Um, all of these things, obviously the intersection routine is somehow different, right? We've already talked about how to intersect a ray with a sphere and a plane. But from the perspective of the ray casting algorithm, that's an abstraction. That's just a thing that I can call uh, from the outside. And so typically when you see how ray tracing uh, code is set up, it's usually set up using this nice object oriented setup, which allows different people to code different plugins really easily. So for example, if I wanted to code a new thing that intersects rays specifically with bunnies, I could do it by just making a new instance of the object 3D class and making my own intersect function and then just throwing that into the mix of uh, my ray tracing code uh, and the whole ray tracing algorithm will still work. So this is just a great example of engineering and certainly on your homework assignment when you actually code a ray tracer, you'll see that this abstraction works out really, really well.
So if you want to learn more about the design of ray tracers, there's many different textbooks out there. Um, here's a few. Actually, I'm missing one. Um, oh no, I'm missing my favorite uh, book on this, which is Physically Based Ray Tracing, also abbreviated as PBRT. Um, this last book is really fun because essentially it's a book that also compiles. So they just have the code for the ray tracer kind of inlined with the textbook uh, and you can download the ray tracer, which is a fully functional, actually perfectly useful ray tracer built into this thing. As you can imagine, this textbook is humongous and it covers all kinds of relevant ideas. Uh, there's a special part of my heart which is dedicated to this realistic ray tracing book because it was my very first computer science textbook that I found at a yard sale, but I digress. Okay, so our next topic and our grab bag of fun things to cover uh, in ray casting and related techniques is something called constructive solid geometry. And I really love this particular algorithm and technique because essentially CSG, by the way, this is often abbreviated CSG, uh, is one of these techniques that's super easy to implement inside of a ray tracer and really, really hard to implement in a different rendering technique like rasterization. So here's the high level idea of constructive solid geometry. The idea is that you have two different shapes. So for example, here I have uh, shape A and shape B. And now, just like I can do Boolean operations on true false values, here I'm gonna do Boolean operations on shape. So for example, probably the easiest one, the one where you don't really need CSG, by the way, is to compute a union, right? So if A is this cube and B is the sphere, then the union of A and B is an object that is composed of both a cube and a sphere. Already using the techniques that we've talked about, you could render this object, right? You would just add the sphere and the cube as two different objects into your scene and then ray trace the whole thing together. But here's the magic of CSG. Let's say that I wanna use that sphere to take a bite out of the side of the cube, right? That's what we see in our second example here. So now I wanna make a new shape that looks like the difference a minus b. Remember that backslash is set theory notation for minus. So again, that's saying use the sphere, but rather than rendering the sphere, there's like negative space here where the sphere used to be. I'm gonna use the sphere as a way to take a bite out of the cube. That's the beauty of CSG is that it's gonna allow us to define new objects by essentially using Boolean operations on sets like uh, subtraction, addition. Here's one um, which is intersection, which is I want to make a shape, which are only the points that are contained inside of the cube and the sphere. Okay, so this is the basic trick of uh, constructive solid geometry is to take these set theoretic operations and use them to build more complicated shapes. In fact, you can do that in a hierarchical fashion and get some really interesting objects. So uh, here's a really classic example in CSG. This is, I don't know, maybe a coffee table or something. Um, and how have we gotten it? Well, let's read the tree from the bottom up. That's probably the easiest way to understand what's going on here. So on the left-hand branch, Maybe I take a cube and I intersect it with a sphere, right? Remember the, this thing means uh, and, it's the intersect. But the cube is somehow a little bit bigger than the sphere. So in this picture, the sphere is kind of poking out the sides of the cube. Then what do I get? I get a sphere with its sides cut off. Now in the right-hand branch, I'm gonna make an object, which is kind of like the X, Y, Z axes, but built out of cylinders. Right, so I have three cylinders here, and now I'm gonna just union them together to get this funny object. And now I'm gonna take this object and subtract it from our sphere uh, with the cube cut out of it, and take a look at what I get. I get a really interesting object, right? This object has holes every which way, I can see through it. Uh, and this is all built uh, out of these CSG operations, right? We have uh, a bunch of unions over here, 
we have an intersection over here. And here we have a, a set minus or a set difference that's building the whole shape together. Now, here's the really interesting thing. This object at the top of our slide here would be really hard to model. Do you see that? I mean, I would need a pretty complicated triangle mesh to make this particular object at the top of the slide. But I've built it out of really simple objects that I have at the bottom of my tree, right? There's a cube, a sphere, and a cylinder. All three of these are fairly straightforward to, um, for example, render in a ray tracer. By the way, notice I used a particular term. These are often called primitives. And the term primitive is a little bit vague. It just is, refers to shapes that are easy to work with and build more complicated shapes out of. So CSG in principle is really quite complicated uh, in terms of the shapes that it can produce, but it's not totally clear how to implement this in practice. So for example, given a triangle mesh of a cube, a sphere, and a cylinder, building a triangle mesh of this complicated object at the top is far from trivial. Uh, in fact, CSG can be used to make all kinds of interesting things. So here's uh, a few more examples. So on the left-hand side, there's some metallic object with a bunch of you know stars and moons cut out of it. Uh, and you can see on the right uh, how they went about actually implementing this. Um, so there's probably this thing was made by taking a sphere, cutting out a cylinder, and then also cutting out these different primitives on the side. Okay. So there are many different CSG uh, operations, uh, and the, you know here's uh, some of the basic ones. So let's say that we're given two different shapes, A and B. Those are the two different circles here. If I want to create the union, uh, then of course that's any point that is inside of A or B, right? So I can write this as A union B. The intersection would be the set of points that are in A and B. And subtraction is saying all the points that are in A but not B. We've already seen two different ways to notate this. So A backslash B, that's the one I prefer. Um, or sometimes people just write A minus B. These mean the same thing. It's the set of points that are inside A but outside of B. Okay, uh, you can also define other ones like X or, those are a little less common in CSG, but they're equally easy to code up. Okay, so the question is, how could we implement CSG in a ray tracer? This is gonna be a really interesting idea where we're never actually gonna construct the 3D model of the final object. We're just gonna do CSG during the ray tracing procedure kind of as we need it. So, this can get really complicated really fast. We have to deal with points that are like in A but outside of B, points that are in B outside of A, and so on. And so when we talk about how to implement CSG, there are a few different ways that we might do it, right? We might think about actually constructing the 3D model of the union, the intersection, subtraction, and so on. That could get complicated, right? We know how to ray trace a sphere, but we don't know how to ray trace like a sphere with a bite out of it. But instead, we're going to make a really sneaky simplification, which is to say in ray tracing, we don't need a 3D model of the CSG. What we need is a way to intersect our ray with that 3D model. Let me say that again. We don't actually need a representation of the final shape that we get by doing union, intersection, subtraction, all that stuff. What we need is just to make sure that we can intersect array with that thing. So in particular, what we're gonna do is implement CSG by thinking about rays that go into our CSG object. And it's very easy to, for example, intersect array with A and B, and then process those points to figure out um, the intersection with the different CSG operations. We're going to dig into that in more detail over the next couple of slides. So to reiterate a little bit, um, to implement CSG, essentially what we're going to need is to figure out what intersections are actually 
inside or outside of a shape. One way that we could do it would be, uh, for example, I could, let's say that I want to identify points that are like inside of A, outside, uh, outside of B or something like that. Well, I could intersect my ray with A or B and then do a test to see, like, is that ray inside of the other shape or not? But then I would need an additional piece of code, right? I'd have to figure out are points inside of a solid or not. Now for a sphere, it's pretty easy to figure out if a point is inside a sphere. But actually, here's a good challenge problem for you to think about. If I give you a triangle mesh and I give you a point, can you write an efficient piece of code that determines whether that point is inside of that triangle mesh? It's actually not so easy. So instead, we're going to make a small update to our ray tracer. So where are we so far? We've convinced ourselves that we don't need a 3D model. We just need to intersect our rays with a 3D model. But that's already tricky because if I try to intersect my ray with A and B, well, I need to be super careful to figure out, like, are those intersection points useful or not? Like, are they actually inside of one of the two shapes or not? A different trick is to extend our ray tracer in a tiny, tiny bit, which is that we're going to say, we're going to implement a ray tracer that doesn't just tell us when a point first or when a ray first hits an object. We're going to give two different t values, which is the point in time when the ray enters the object, and then a second point of time when the ray exits the same object. Okay, so these are intervals. And so these are like entry and exit bits for our different intersections. And why, could, why are we going to do that? Well, it's going to essentially take our CSG problem and reduce it to a one-dimensional problem per ray, right? So like here's a ray here. We have these two intervals saying when we're inside of A and B. If we wanted, for example, the intersection, we just have to intersect two one-dimensional intervals, which is a lot easier. And that's what's going to make CSG easy with ray casting. We'll see an example in just a moment. But to reiterate, it's really hard using explicit representations, right? So if I wanted to make a video game that implemented CSG and rasterization, we'll see that that's really, really difficult because they actually need a triangle mesh of the CSG output. Now, in principle, in ray tracing, we'll see CSG is, in, uh, is, is pretty simple, um, but it involves some floating point values. Uh, and so because of rounding and some other challenges, we're going to have to fudge our computation a tiny, tiny bit. And we'll talk about that too. Before we get there, let's do a quick example. So let's say that I have a ray. And remember that when we do CSG, what we're going to do is not just output the T at which our ray enters the shape, but also the T at which it exits. So here, uh, notice that essentially what I'm saying is that we enter uh, shape A at time 1 and exit at time 3. Similarly, we enter shape B at time two and enter an exit at time six. So now when we do CSG, let's say we want to compute the interval of time in which we're inside of A minus B. So what is A minus B? It's like just this semicircle here, right? This is A minus B. So what do we do? We take these two intersection, these two intervals, right? One, three, two, six. And we take uh, one, three and subtract two, six. And what we're left with is one, two, right? And that corresponds to this interval here. Let's do a second one. So if I want to know the in time for a union B, well, all I have to do is take the union of these two intervals. So what I'll get is 1, 6. And that makes sense, right? Because that's this entire span here. And then finally, if I want the intersection, well, I can take these two intervals and intersect them. And I'll get just the interval 2, 3, which corresponds to this piece here. And... Oops. Oh, no. Thankfully, <laughs> my backup slides actually agree with the uh, quick computation that we just did in class. So hopefully you guys see the basic trick, which is that our ray tracer, if we want to implement CSG, 
All it has to do is output two values inside of one, which is the exit time and the entry time. I guess probably in the other order, the entry time and the exit time. Uh, and that is enough information uh, to do subtraction, union, intersection, XOR, all that good stuff, just by doing arithmetic on intervals. We never actually intersect our array with the shape, just with its constituent shapes, and then start intersecting and doing arithmetic in one dimension instead. This is such a clever idea, and just really interesting, right, that I can ray trace this pretty complicated shape here, even though I can't actually represent it. The only thing I can do is represent its constituent parts. Okay. There are a lot of details that come up a lot in ray tracing that are really annoying. Um, and one of them is precision. So for example, if our ray just grazes an object, just barely touches it, um, then we can have problems with rounding where maybe by accident it ends up being a little tiny interval or maybe it ends up outside. Um, this is a big problem with floating point approximation. And trust me when I say that you don't want to implement a ray tracer using exact arithmetic, unless you have a really good reason to. And so what do we do? Well, you know, computer graphics is not, we're not in 6006. We can make some approximations. Um, we typically fudge it a little bit. <laughs> um, and so a very particular parameter that shows up in a lot of ray tracers is to keep some number epsilon around that says, if the values in my computation are getting below the scale epsilon, then maybe I'll start to do some approximations that favor numerical stability over the correctness of my formula. Um, so for example, one typical thing is that I don't start my ray at t equals zero. I think of it as my ray starting at t as equal to epsilon or larger. <clears throat> And the reason is that maybe it's really not so good if there's an object behind the camera that for whatever reason, thanks to rounding, when I intersect my ray with that object, basically gives me t equals zero or even a slightly positive uh, value. So I, I typically start my rays at a slightly positive value epsilon. This actually becomes even more important when we start talking about secondary rays. So remember, we've already suggested uh, two lectures ago, or maybe last lecture, hmm, I don't remember, um, how we might intersect a uh, ray with an object and then make a secondary ray for shadows and so on, right? So what do I do? I, you know, I, here's my eye. Here's an object I'm trying to render. So I get this intersection point. And now I'm going to send off a secondary ray to this light to see if there should be a shadow. Well, if I start my secondary ray right on the surface, what's going to happen when I intersect that ray with the scene? Well, my ray trace is going to say, yes, you intersected an object in the scene, namely the object you started on. It's just going to return back the sphere, right? Because your ray trace is being a bit of a uh, smart ass here. And so a typical thing to do might be to take your ray and actually offset it a tiny, tiny bit along the ray's direction of motion um, before calling that intersection routine, right? So in other words, remember that we have R0 plus T R D. That was our original um, formula for array. To offset it a tiny bit, we might instead use R0 plus epsilon R D plus T R D. So this thing is our like slightly offset point. Now, depending on what you're doing, you may want to offset along the surface normal or along the direction of the ray, and that's one that you have to think through a tiny bit. Now, really dealing with this epsilon in a consistent way is quite tricky, and, and if you write an industry ray tracer, you'll have to be super careful about these kinds of matters. In uh, 6837, we're going to be pretty sloppy about it because we're not fancy pants engineers, but... Well, many of you are, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so for example, one of the really annoying things to get right um, is rendering triangle meshes because what you really don't want to have happen is like maybe right at the seam along two triangles that share an edge that you accidentally punch a little bit of a hole. Um, so this is a hard thing to get right. Uh, and one that I encourage you to test in the ray tracers that you write in this course 
because there's some probability that you'll get it wrong. And in particular, when you draw two triangles that share an edge, you might actually peek through that edge a tiny, tiny bit in your rendered image, which of course would be no good in industry. And so people think really, really carefully about how to insert tolerance in their uh, ray tracing code in just the right way. Notice that basically in this little piece of our lecture, I'm just kind of telling you, you know, the consequences may be dire, but I'm not telling you all the different hacks that people do uh, to round their rays in different fashions. This is just a warning that when you implement a ray tracer in practice, a very typical thing to do is to keep around a tolerance parameter epsilon and think about it super carefully to make sure that a surface doesn't intersect itself, right? So if I'm rendering a shiny sphere and my ray should bounce off of the surface, I don't want to bounce it and then just, when I compute my intersection, get the same surface back. Um, but at the same time, if I round incorrectly, I might puncture holes in my surfaces and that would be no good. Okay, so one more trick that we should talk about in ray casting before we move on to ray tracing is how to insert transformations into our ray casting technique. So of course, we don't just wanna render spheres that are centered at the origin, right? That's what we covered last time. We like to be able to put our spheres anywhere in our 3D scene. And moreover, we may want to tile a bunch of spheres or triangles around and reuse the same piece of code. This is an idea called instancing. So instancing is this idea that I wanna model an object once but then I may want to repeat it in my rendered scene. So what does this allow us to do? Well, it allows us to do goofy stuff like uh, render this weird, <laughs> I don't know, I, somehow it looks like a religious uh, ceremony between these stick figures. It would be a pretty inefficient way to model this scene if I had to make, you know, 20 or however many different copies of this stick figure model with a top hat <laughs> and tile them over and over and over again in my 3D scene. So instead in my ray tracer, a very typical thing to do might be to make a single version of that 3D model and then to make a bunch of objects which essentially are just different transformations of that same thing. You know, here's another typical example, you know, making a checkerboard with a bunch of different pieces. And so this is this idea of instancing that I want to store an object once, like the uh, stick figure in our <laughs> ritual uh, stick figure top hat uh, scene that we're rendering here, um, but then I want to use it often uh, in my scene. And moreover, when I use it more than once, I don't want to just keep putting it in the same place. I want to apply different transformations. In fact, maybe uh, in my stick figure uh, worship ritual here, one of them starts getting taller, uh, then I might want to store a matrix that transforms this point uh, in particular fashion. So a very typical thing to do in instancing is not just to store an object you want to instance, but also a transformation matrix M that might, for example, stretch, rotate, shear, or translate uh, the object in different ways. So as with everything in ray tracing, there are many options for how you could implement instancing. Some of them are easy and some of them are hard. So for example, you could ask your engineer to manually <laughs> incorporate transforms into every single object that you implement. So for example, in our previous lecture, we only talked about dealing with spheres that are centered at the origin, but maybe instead, will just say that, sorry, your sphere class, if you want it to do something interesting, also has to deal with translations and scales. And sure, that'll deal with it, but of course, for complicated 3D models, that'll get annoying. Even for not complicated models, that's annoying. So for example, if I stretch my sphere uh, twice, then already our code for intersecting a sphere and a line gets way more complicated. I need to deal with like the major and minor axes of the uh, ellipsoid in order to do that. But here's the really liberating thing about ray tracing. Just similar to what we already talked about in constructive solid geometry, we don't actually need an explicit description of the scene. We just need a way to intersect our rays with the scene. So specifically, one thing I can do is rather than transforming the object, I'm going to transform the ray. 
And that is to say that we're going to move the ray from the world space, right? The world space is on the left-hand side. That's where the sphere looks like an ellipsoid. And instead, I'm going to kind of obtain the uh, ray in, from the perspective of this stretched out object by applying the inverse transformation to the ray. So in particular, if I have a matrix M, which is taking points in the object space and transforming them to the world space by translating, stretching, shearing, whatever, then I'm going to take M and move it to the other side. That's what we see here. And to move our ray into this new coordinate system. So remember that the ray is moving around in world space. So I need to apply M inverse to get the ray in object space. Now we're going to do this in a little more detail. Well, what should be the new origin of our ray? So remember that M, remember we can think of our matrices kind of like this. M is going to input something in object space and output something in world space, the way that we've defined M. So if we want to transform our ray to be from the perspective of the object space on the right-hand side, then we need to multiply by M inverse to get the new origin of the ray. Because remember that the origin is just a point. And similarly, well, the direction of the ray is a vector. So I need to multiply that by M inverse as well where, what are we doing? Well, once again, we're using homogeneous coordinates and we're gonna represent the direction as a homogeneous coordinate where that fourth value is zero. So this is the really cool trick, which is to say, if I wanna intersect a ray with a transform object, I'm gonna transform the ray instead and then get the T value, at which point the, these two objects intersect and use the, you know, maybe applying M in the reverse direction to tell us about the original scene. This is just like CSG, where we haven't actually modeled this ellipsoid. We don't have a triangle mesh of this transformed object. We're instead just modifying our routine for intersecting rays. Now, of course, we need to deal with this T value, and there's actually two different objects. So in particular, if M includes some scaling, then when we multiply our direction, our direction might have started out as a unit vector, but it is no longer normalized. It is not necessarily unit anymore after we apply M to it. So in our intersection code, we're gonna to have to be a little bit careful. And there's actually two different ways out. One is that we could divide the direction by its length, and then do our normal calculations. But this is going to be a bit annoying because now when I go back to um, world space, I'm going to have to account for that. Or I can just extend my ray tracer a tiny bit to deal with direction vectors that are not unit length. And this is almost always the preferred op option. Okay, so let's go over those two options in more detail. Now, the first one, what do I do? I transform my ray, and then I now have a ray in object space, but its direction is not unit length, so I normalize it. But when I do that, I end up with a problem, which is that the T in object space is not the same as the T in world space. So I have to rescale, and that's just yet another opportunity for a bug um, and for extra floating point arithmetic. So the preferred option is to just leave the direction alone, but make sure that when we write code for intersecting rays with objects that we account for the fact that um, the direction vector of the ray may not be unit length. And in that case, here's the kind of amazing thing that happens. The T value actually doesn't change. <laughs> Let's see if we can see that. So in particular, Remember that um, our ray looks like ray origin plus t times ray direction. And eventually, this is going to look like m, which is a transformation, times some p on the surface. What did we do in our code? Essentially, we just took this expression and multiplied both sides by m inverse. 
equals p like that, right? And this is the coordinate system in which we solve for t, right? So this becomes our new origin. This becomes our new direction. This becomes the point that we find on the surface. But notice that there's the same t in both of these formulas. So unlike the previous solution, which would have normalized the second vector, if I just leave it alone, then I can just reuse the t for the intersection time in object space and return that in my code, and it actually gives me the correct intersection time for the original ray on the transform object. So this is pretty incredible. Um, and so it allows us to do things like apply all kinds of different homogeneous uh, transformations to our 3D shapes. I've given you all kinds of matrices here, but the reality is that all that matters is making sure that you get the distinction between points and vectors correct. There's one last detail that I'm going to conclude with for today, and that's how to transform normal vectors. Remember that normal vectors are 90 degrees perpendicular to a surface. And here's where things get a little bit fishy. So here on the top side, I've drawn for you something that is incorrect. <laughs> and namely, uh, I've taken a shape, two shapes, one is a square and one is a circle. And I've computed their normal vectors. And then I've transformed both the shape and the normal vectors using the same matrix. So for example, here I'm doing a shear to the uh, square and I'm doing a stretch to the circle. So if I apply that same matrix to the vectors, I get these objects here. Now, initially, if I kind of glance, these vectors, I mean, they look nice, <laughs> but they're not the normal vectors to the, to the surface. So for example, in this uh, sheared square here, what should be the normal to the upper line here? The normal should still be pointing straight up, right? That's what's not 90 degrees to the surface. But instead, by applying the wrong matrix, notice that this angle is not 90 degrees anymore, right? So this bottom row is the correct normal transformation. Similarly, uh, for the circle, you'll see that you end up with all kinds of crazy incorrect normal vectors if you use the same matrix to transform the surface and its normals. So in the last 10 minutes today, we're going to try and do this calculation the right way. Now, the way to do this calculation correctly is to think about the tangent plane rather than the normal vector. At least this is one way to do it, and it's, to me, I think the, uh, the easiest one. So just like before, we have a matrix M. M acts on things in object space in our instancing code and outputs an object in world space. And the question is, how should we use M to transform the normals to our surface when we do that, right? Because normals are going to be needed um, to do things like uh, rendering, right? Uh, uh, in particular, to figure out the lighting values. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose a point in the tangent plane to our surface. We're going to transform that point, And then we're going to see how this affects the normal vectors. OK, so let me get rid of some of the extra stuff on that slide so I have some space to write. All I did was shift stuff up. Um, so we have our intersection point in object space in our ray tracing code. right? That's what we've already computed. We know how to do that now. The question is, let's say that I want to return in my instancing code, not only the intersection point, which we can get from that T value, but also the normal to the surface at that intersection point. So I can do things like Lambertian shading. Okay. So, right. How, how can I go about this? Well, let's take a vector in the tangent plane rather than a normal vector. And we can write that as V in object space. Okay, so uh, remember that a tangent plane vector is like just barely grazing the surface. So by definition, the tangent plane is given by the locus of points that are perpendicular, or the locus of vectors that are perpendicular to the normal. So I can write that the normal in object space dot product with a vector in object space in the tangent plane this should equal zero. Okay, so now what are we going to do? 
Well, here's what's going to be really sneaky. We're going to wedge M inside of there. In particular, of course, M inverse times M is equal to the identity. So I can stick it anywhere I want in my expression and nothing changes. So I'm going to write the normal in object space times M inverse times M times our tangent vector space. Well, this thing is still equal to zero because this is just the identity that I've added into our expression. Now let's group this in a slightly different way. Now the transpose of a product is the product of the transposes. So in particular, I can write that uh, this is uh, M inverse transpose times the normal in object space. And here I have M times the uh, vector in object space. So again, what have I done? I've just gotten rid of the parentheses that I wrote here. I've parenthesized it in this fashion instead, and then factored the transpose. Okay. So now let's uh, stare at this for a minute. So although we don't know how to transform normals, we do know how to transform vectors, right? So what is M times a vector in the tangent plane? Uh, well, that's just the same as writing that vector in world space. Oops, let's write that better. Because by definition, M is the thing that takes you in object space and maps you to world space. If you don't trust me about that, by the way, if I wanted a tangent vector, I could think of it as the difference between two points, like P2 minus P1 in the tangent plane, right? So I could write V as equal to P2 minus P1. And we do know that M acts on points perfectly fine. So this would end up being M times P2 minus M times P1. and it's pretty easy to convince yourself that that should be in the tangent plane of the uh, object in world space. Okay, so what have we done here? So let's uh, write it again. So this is M minus T normal O S transpose V W S. By the way, um, hopefully you guys remember that the dot product like A dot B a different way to write that in linear algebra is A transpose times B, if we think of A and B as column uh, vectors. And that's exactly what's going on here, right? So this is just a uh, dot product. Okay. So take a look at what just happened here. I have a vector in the tangent plane in world space. I have some vector that I'm taking the dot product with and I'm getting zero. So what must this object be? This is actually the normal in world space, right? Because it is a thing whose dot product with a tangent vector in world space is equal to zero. Okay, um, by the way, this is up to scale meaning that I may have to normalize this thing because typically you really do want your normals to be uh, unit length. So here uh, on this slide, I've taken the derivation on the previous slide and just written it in uh, you know, nicer uh, math notation here. So we started out with the one thing that we know is true, which is that the normal and object space dot product with a vector in the tangent plane is zero. And just by essentially inserting M inverse times M and then refactoring, we can show that the normal in world space is M inverse transpose times the normal in object space. Again, up to scale. Because we usually do assume that normals are unit length. So to summarize, essentially what we've shown is the following, that um, when we transform positions, we can do that with the matrix M to go from object space to world space, similarly for directions like tangent directions and vectors. But to transform the normal vector correctly, you multiply by M inverse transpose. Incidentally, a common source of bugs, 
if I have a rotation matrix, and I take its inverse transpose, I actually get that same rotation matrix back. So if I rotate, uh, then all of these things agree. But if I shear or scale or whatever, then it becomes uh, less clear. Okay, so that's it for today. So as a quick recap, we covered a lot of different things in today's lecture. We talked about barycentric coordinates and how to intersect rays with triangles. We mentioned how to do a little bit of object-oriented design for ray casting, namely that I can abstract away the concept of an object uh, and just leave behind um, a function that intersects rays with that thing. And then we talked about two special cases. One was CSG, where we showed it's easy to intersect a ray with a CSG object by using intervals uh, and interval arithmetic rather than actually constructing that 3D model. Then we talked about instancing and transformations, and the really key thing to get right there is the transformation of the normal vector. So that does it for today. Uh, in our next lecture, we're going to move on from ray casting to ray tracing and talk about secondary rays.